Okay, so it wasn't my proudest moment this summer, Shomo, but I know there was something I said this summer to you. You probably don't remember. Actually, you probably do remember because <laughs> you remember everything that I say. I remember what you don't remember. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I remember the words coming out of my mouth at some point this summer, I don't trust you, which was really rare for me because I do trust you. You're my every. You're my everything. You're my person, you know. But we had so much chaos this summer. So many things happened. I don't think we've ever had a summer with as much transition with all of our kids. Each of them had just major stuff going on that just fell on us. And our car was totaled. And we just had a million different things going on. And I remember saying, I don't trust you. And I've thought about that moment since then. And I'm like, why did I even say that? It doesn't make sense. If there's any one person I trust in this world, it's you. So today I wanted to talk with the couples about the concept of trust because we have so many people reach out to us. I don't trust my spouse. And it's a really hard thing. And I feel like it's a loaded topic. It's a loaded conversation because it's so important. And without trust, what do you have? It just feels like you have nothing. That's how I felt. And I thought we should share a little bit with our viewers about talking about trust. And a little bit more about it. I remember when, when I shared it, and then I finally had time to calm down later, I was thinking to myself, wait a minute. When I said that, I feel that it was coming out of my own uh, childhood wounds. Because as a child, I didn't feel like I had anybody I could trust. I don't feel like people looked out for me and really took care of my basic needs. I had a very chaotic childhood, and sometimes I didn't know where I was sleeping that night. So I realized saying that I don't trust you kind of wasn't fair for so many reasons, but one of them being that that came from my world, right? It came from my pain. So that really had nothing to do with you. Maybe a little bit was like you didn't, I don't know, take out the garbage on Wednesday when the trash guys come. And, and, and that's fair to say that I don't trust you for that. So I don't know. Let's just unpack this a little bit for other couples that might feel like they can't trust their partner. Yeah. So trust, there are various degrees of trust. And I would say, what would you say? Uh, infractions of trust so are, that, that are, that are, it depends on what they are. You know, we're, when you think of trust, you think about, you know, infidelity, things like that, which we'll address. But let's start kind of with like the basic level of of mistrust. So the one thing is kind of like, as you're mentioning, for that a lot of it's projecting our own issues on our partner. So if we have a story like your story, like nobody, I can't rely on anyone. I have to do everything myself. And that's my kind of theme song in life. And then I'm going to either attract someone into my life, a partner, a spouse who is not, who I can't rely on either, or I'm going to project that I can't rely on them, or maybe I'm going to provoke them to not be reliable. But I'm going to recreate that reality. Now, it doesn't mean that it's okay. <laughs> All because you had a childhood experience of not being able to trust someone and rely on someone doesn't mean it's okay for me not to be reliable. Mm. But at the same time, the severity of it and the disproportionate response, as you said, I don't remember what it was, but it wasn't like anything a like major. major breach of trust. It was it could have been something like I didn't give the kids their you know vitamins <laughs> when one of them had a cold Not or something, like something like that. And I mean, it was probably a little more than that, but you know, it was something like that. Um, like of so obviously, yes, maybe I you didn't count on me to do what you wanted me to do at that moment. But did it merit the reaction? Mm. So th that's what we call the 90-10 rule. It's anything that really bothers us is 10% about what the other did to trigger us and 90% our reaction. Right. So in this case, 10% of it was you didn't give the kids their vitamins and I was worried about them getting sick or whatever. But 90% of it was my huge response, which was I don't trust you. And at that moment, I felt like, I needed to run because that that would have been my gut reaction. Right. It's like, for example, it's, if somebody was in combat in Afghanistan, 
and they and all of a sudden now they're back to civilian life they're walking down a major me, me, metropolitan city in America and they hear i don't know like the a really big what do they call those things around the, the <laughs> A jackhammer? Not a jackhammer, but anyway, some type of really loud noise that you could hear in Manhattan or a city like that. So their instinctual reaction is to feel like they're back in combat, even though the reality is they're not. So this is something that's really important to us. I've been thinking about this a lot more lately because uh, over the over time, you know, we've been doing this work for a while, and it's all about getting into feelings and what are you feeling in your childhood. And I would say it's about your reality. It's about both of you have different realities. But what is your reality based on? Your really reality is based on whatever you kind of your thoughts and what you're thinking about things. It's not necessarily an objective reality. So when there's a loud noise, it's not objectively, it's not objective reality that you're in danger. It's that subjective reality based on your trauma, based on your past experience. And that's how we're living our lives, and that's how we were getting triggered in relationship, and that's how we're overreacting and causing ourselves a lot of pain. Now, overreacting might trigger some of you out there thinking, like, what does that mean? Is Rabbi Slacken saying, like, I'm overreacting when my spouse is being completely unreliable? Right. So we're dealing with some – we haven't gotten to the more, like, severe breaches of trust, and – Everyone's entitled to their feelings, and everyone's feelings are valid, and everyone's feelings make sense, especially based on the reality. But, And it's never for us to challenge someone else and say, well, your feelings are just like, that's just your thoughts, your feelings, it's your problem. No, you have to take responsibility for what you're doing in the relationship to trigger your partner and to be sensitive to that. But for those of us that are listening who want to think about what can I do to work on, on myself, I know I want my spouse to do X, Y, and Z or to be more sensitive, but what can I do to lessen the damage and to be more responsible and take ownership for my feelings and emotions? I need to start thinking about this. Wait a minute. Is this really, you know, is this really real? You know, when when someone doesn't give the vitamins, right, that's kind of what I was thinking. is it really like that I can't trust you and I think that you're just like not going to take care of me? Is that is that really what I'm thinking? Or is this I have this story that to become conscious. And then when you become conscious, you can make a a conscious choice of how to respond in that situation. And sometimes it will take time. Like it definitely took me a couple weeks after the fact when it was a quiet moment, nobody was home. And I kind of thought to myself, why did I say that? Why did I feel that? And I remembered through the work we've done with Imago therapy about the childhood story. And I knew that's where it had come from. And I, and I, and we never really talked about this until right now. Um, and of course, it was hurtful to hear, and I felt it was unfair. And at the same time, I didn't bring it up, probably because, you know, I say we've been here before. I know that, you know, one of us tends to, re you know, the, well, the, we talk about the turtle and the hailstorm, that you have more sh stronger emotional reactions than I do, and you might say things that you might even don't forget about, that I remember. But I realized that, okay, obviously you're having a bad day. There's something bother, you know, it's something triggered you. I don't need to get all wrapped up in it and fuel the cycle there. Mm. So I over think we were able to get through it better than we would have 23 years ago when we first got married without having these tools. Yeah, for sure. If you said that to me when we were married, like in the beginning of our relationship, I would have been like, what do you, yeah. like, how dare you? <laughs> you know, yes, it would have been. You know, I'm the most reliable person <laughs> that you know. I mean, it actually was our first our first session was about went back to this story because yeah. I didn't fix a closet rod and I'm not much of a repairman, but I didn't fix a closet rod in our daughter's bedroom. Uh, bedroom in her in her closet. And that was our first imago therapy session. And it went back to I can't, I can't rely on anyone. And now I can't rely on you either. Yeah. So, and if you're curious about that argument we have in our course, we have 14 of our fights and that was definitely one of the best ones in there but we work through it in the video so couples can watch so you can watch and see how we work through it but I guess what you're saying Shlomo is so I guess step number one in talking about trust understanding if you can when you're calm later where is this coming from what is my childhood pain around this right and how am I projecting it onto what is what is the role that I play in this in this process? right so that I don't have to react as strongly it doesn't mean you have to give up the, the pain that you have or 
that you should just let your spouse do whatever they can want to do and and not be responsible. It's not giving your spouse an ex- the offender, so to speak, an excuse, but it's helping you calm down so that you don't react. And when you react, you're going to provoke a a reaction from your spouse. So the more that you can do to be aware of it, it's going to stop the escalation that's so common in relationships. Right. So you know there are certain things that. There are a lot of things that could be happening. For example, let's say, let me give this example. If your spouse has their own business and they're having a slow month, so you could feel like, I don't trust you to support me and take care of me. And you can say such a comment. Well, that's really hurtful to someone who works really hard. At the same time, it makes sense that you might be anxious because you know, there's not much money coming in this month. So you know, how do you balance that out? How do you do? And it could be that you feel like maybe your spouse needs to work a little bit harder, or they're being lazy, or they're not motivated. Uh, those you can have those feelings. You can talk about that in a safe way, not in blaming the other person, but a safe, productive conversation you can have about those things. But at the same time, when you start making grandiose statements that kind of tear away at the fabric of the relationship, that's not always fair for the right. Res- it's on the receiving. To have- it's important to have some sender responsibility in how you deliver your comments because nobody should ever have to bear the brunt of, you know, verbal abuse. So that's that was kind of like the the lower on the totem pole breaches of trust issues. Right. And we have other videos on how to heal after a very large breach of trust, like an affair or financial infidelity. If we would go to the other end of the spectrum, Shlomo, you know, a quick word on larger be- breaches of trust and the process yeah. for for uncovering more about that. Yeah, those are harder because when you get into a relationship and you you commit to someone, what essentially by committing your life to someone, you know, whether you have vow, whatever you say in your wedding vows, or this the idea of being married to someone is usually represents some type of exclusivity that. I'm in relationship with you. And when you're when there's infidelity, which means like not being faithful, you're not being faithful to that partnership, to that commitment that you made. So you're starting off with almost like an assumption that if I'm marrying you, that means it's the two of us, nobody else. And then when there's a breach of trust, when somebody has infidelity, when there is even if they're lying, uh, they're not being f- truthful in other areas or financial infidelity, but even all the more so when you're dealing with another person, emotional infidelity or a real full-blown physical affair, um, it's very devastating to a relationship. In fact, you know they say that around. I don't always really believe in statistics, but because you can manipulate them however you want. But they say you know 70% of couples that had where there's infidelity um, don't make it. But that's if they don't get help. We find that with imago therapy that if couples get help that they can be able to heal. It doesn't mean that it's easy, but they can be able to heal. So it's hard because you're already going in assuming that there is a commitment, and then that's broken. So you can never fully get back to that place from before the breach of trust because there's always, no matter what work you do, there's always that little voice that could potentially rear its ugly head and say, well, I wonder why he or she's not home right now. Or if they're mean, mad at me today, like, oh, are they going to go you know, call somebody or cheat on me or there's there's that fear. And uh, that's a valid fear. So what we said before about childhood, this also can come up. Besides, before we get to dealing with the, you know, here and now, people have childhood issues. A lot of times we see that people who have trust issues or people who came grew up in a home where they saw one of their parents cheat, um, oftentimes they wind up marrying somebody who cheats on them. Um, it doesn't mean that it's, a, you know, a curse that's going to happen. But we do, we do notice that. It's not uncommon. And therefore, it makes it even worse. No one likes to be cheated on. But when people have that pain from childhood and living in a home like that, it, makes, it really pushes their buttons even more so. So they have even a dis- more stronger reaction to right. the because affair. They feel like probably, I would imagine, I finally got out of my childhood home. I finally attracted somebody who I love. And... And I got out of that situation, and then you enter marriage, and it almost like it repeats itself. It repeats itself. And it's so devastating when that happens. And, and that's what we believe in Imago, is you attract somebody who's going to repeat a lot of the things that you saw. Yeah, they'll push your buttons. And even if it's not, even sometimes they don't 
they might not have a, an affair, but there could be other breaches of trust. But if you're already coming in with trust issues from childhood, and you see it in the relationship, it makes it much harder. Yeah. So you have that that aspect. But even if you don't have that childhood aspect, it's still a devastating thing because this is the person that you devoted your life to, that you committed to. And now do you see that they have... It's not even what they did that is as bad as the deceit. Mm. Because now, well, if I can't trust you about that, can I trust you about anything? Mm -hmm. Now, if you're not home right now, can I assume that you're you know, doing what you say you're doing? Or maybe you're do up to no good. So there is that questioning. So there is a very specific process that we do with couples to help sort out what happened, um, which means even opening up and sharing and answering any questions about the affair because, again, it's it's a lack of trust that that's the problem um, because people who have emotional infidelity, people who have physical infidelity, it's I would say it can be just as devastating, even if you never met the person, uh, if some online affair. It's just as devastating for the spouse who has cheated on because there is that breach of trust. So repairing that requires admitting what you did, um, answering any questions, Transparency. Transparency, transparency, right. Because if the idea is lack of trust, the only way to create trust is to have a relationship where there is trust. Mm. And even though you can't change what happened in the past, you can show transparency. And the more you can show, and you know what, sometimes it means people, here, take my phone, you can get my, I have all my passwords, I have nothing to hide. Of course, the more that the person who, who breached the trust goes out of their way to show that they want to repair, then that definitely expedites the process. But you can't force that. You can't force that. But, like, for example, if someone's like, but you know the person feels bad about what they did, and you know that they want to, to change and make it better. So it gives a person who has cheated on a little bit more faith in their partner and commitment. But if you see the person's like, well, Adam, they're not really showing much interest. They don't even want to complain. I mean, they would say they don't even want to apologize. apologize. Or like, I already apologize, but I have to keep doing it. Like, you know, it's enough already. It. Like, get over it. Or, you know, maybe they're going to the bathroom with their phone. They're, they're still doing behaviors that don't necessarily promote trust. Well, it's a little bit hard to really believe that they want to be in the relationship. And how do I know that they're not still talking to this other person? Unfortunately, I've seen that happen, too, that people come even to a two-day intensive to deal with the affair and... We find out later that they didn't stop speaking to the other person, and the other person's still feeding them mm. the messages that they have to say together. So it, it doesn't really promote trust. It doesn't promote healing when one person is not really fully invested in showing that they want to change. So the more a person can engage in the process of, of change, of admitting what they did wrong, of asking for forgiveness, and doing new behaviors to rebuild the relationship the better it is, the more the process will be expedited, the more the couple can move on and build a, an even better relationship. And um, as unfortunate as a breach of trust is, sometimes it's, the silver lining is that it actually can force the couple to really deal with their issues and to deal with the disconnect that kind of created that fertile ground where this where the where the infidelity happened so that they can actually make a better relationship moving forward. Yeah, we see that all the time. We've, we've kind of become known as... Our, our intensives have become really known for couples that experienced affairs. Some of them, um, we were just featured in an article, and it was about how much will couples pay to save the relationship after an affair. And we have a workshop coming up in Costa Rica, a five-day, four-night uh, couples retreat. And um, we, we have seen many couples improve their relationship even better than it was before the affair. Right, because so much is laid up on the table, and it's almost like they're reevaluating their priorities and their values and their vows, and almost getting like a do-over in a way. Yeah. Um, which you didn't ask for, you know, because um, it was certainly painful to begin with. But and you're they're saying that the relationship also wasn't it's an interrupt, but the, the relationship it wasn't so great in the first place, mm. um, because nobody wakes up one morning and say, oh, you know, I think it's a good day to go uh, cheat. <laughs> You know, it's usually there's some, and it's it's not. No, this is not to be meant to to take that this is the the spouse's fault, meaning the spouse who is cheated on is fault. It's whatever the situation is, whatever the baggage both people bring, but for whatever reason, the needs weren't being met in the relationship, and not just physical needs. We're talking about emotional needs. There, there's a disconnect. Uh, 
they're not communicating effectively, whatever it was, there was the relationship was not in an optimal state. And then someone paid attention to the one spouse and you know, one thing led to the other. Yeah, so don't lose hope if you your relationship did suffer from an affair. Know that on the one hand, it's really hard to fix on your own. Like it can be catastrophic if it's not dealt with with a professional to help walk you through the amends process and the full transparency and everything Shlomo described. But on the other hand, know that your relationship can be much stronger and much more solid with after the aftermath. So if you're curious about that, we can definitely share resources with you. If not in person, we also have some worksheets for people to actually go through what happened and how to repair. So we can share that link in the description of the video. And if you have questions about trust and just anything related to this topic, definitely get in touch with us. There's still more to talk about trust and how to deal with feeling like you can't trust your spouse, right? Yeah. Like what else would you say, Shlomo, for people who didn't have an affair and their relationship happened, thankfully, but maybe they just don't feel like they can fully rely on their spouse? Yeah, I think that it's a lot of people have issues with trust and it becomes difficult. I mean, I would say in society in general, like with all the upheaval in the last number of years, um, people have tr people have trouble trusting authority, trusting that, you know, that the authorities uh, have their, your best interest in mind. Uh, there's a lot of there are a lot of different uh, guess, permutations of, of this and how it how it erupts. And I think that. You know, as we get older also, I think that as we start hearing more about, actually, I would say not just because we're older, but also because of the information that we're being fed on a, on a constant basis, we're learning more a lot of the, about things that we wouldn't have known about in the past. Uh, so it's not just we're, we're older, but... How do you mean? I mean, uh, it's just, I know, like, whatever it's scandals or, you know, things that have come up, we know about what's going on all over the world every moment, every second. You mean in the news. In the news, but even just like in our communities, in the news, about things, people that we thought were, we respected, and then it turns out that they, you know, did some type of impropriety. Um, so many different things. And it just, it makes it very difficult. And it makes it difficult to really, really trust. So on the one hand, it, the, the, I would say the, the downside is that it can lead us to feel really jaded and really like distrusting of everyone. And that doesn't really make for a nice uh, life. A life, yeah, because it's just like you're just constantly like, well, I don't trust you. And so, you know, you'd hope at least you can trust your spouse. It's like, even though the world is crazy out there, it's like at least we have each other. Mm. Mm. So also, that is, yeah. I thought of after this whole summer. I think by the end of the summer and all the upheaval we had, I kind of feel like it served to just strip away what was not important. For me and it just almost cut me to the core and I realized okay what is important like the bare minimum and I also realized that I needed to let go a bit like I needed to let go a bit of my expectations for let's say the family one of our kids decided he was done with school <laughs> I was like I'm done with school well wait a minute you're how old like you're not just done with school like we don't do that you know but it was like that was he's not the, like 10 or 12 I mean, that was one bit. of the examples <laughs> that we had to quickly adjust our expectations of this child and you know it was such an upheaval but at the end of the summer i kind of like just had a moment and thought about all the kids and i thought okay i had to reevaluate a lot of expectations and priorities but at the end of the day you know everybody was safe everybody was healthy everybody was alive and in our home and everyone's in the place where they need to be and are successful right so but we have to write it's like it's our our idea our thoughts about exactly the way things sp are supposed to be that gets us into trouble i say that you know expectations are premeditated resentment so having these expectations and and i think this this applies in all relationships especially in a marriage you don't know what tomorrow brings nobody knows and I think we learned a lot about i mean the world has changed so much even in the last few years who would have ever thought we would have this you know, global lockdown for I don't know how long it even went for. It's just, and now we're kind of forgetting about it because it's, you know, it's over, we Hopefully. hope. Uh, <laughs> but who would have ever thought of that? I mean, today's actually 9-11. Who would have ever thought of that? I remember when we, we were just newly married. 
So we don't know, and it's a really about trust. And for those of you who are, you know, people of faith, you know, trusting in God, um, realizing that I can't predict tomorrow. I don't have, I don't have the answers. And the more that you can do that, the happier you're going to be because you can just live in the moment. Mm. And I think this applies especially in relationships. You know, when people when people get married and they sit, you know, under the when they're at their wedding, they're not thinking that their spouse is going to cheat on them, or or their spouse is going to betray them in another way, or they're not going to be able to rely on them. No one's thinking about that. So, and hopefully it never happens. But just to realize we have no control, and the more we can give up that control, it doesn't mean that oh, I'm just going to let you walk over all over me and do whatever you want. And you now you you both have to show up and be the best partner, the best spouse you can be for each other, to be reliable, to be faithful, um, to follow through, to be loving, to be safe. All those things we, we, we encourage you both, both people to do and to do the best that you can. But in terms of being in control of the outcome, being in control of every incident that happens, you can't. And the more that you try to do that, the more miserable you're going to be. Mm. And if something bothers you, you need to learn the tools to be able to communicate that and work through it together. Yeah, and we would say it's not about letting go and then realizing, like, forget my partner. I want to be on my own. I'm just going to lose him. In our, in our approach, we would say that's a sign that you need to cre- learn how to create emotional safety between the two of you in your space, right? It's not just about I don't trust you and I deserve better, so I'm going to go. It's right. This is an opportunity that something could be – worked on here something could feel safer emotionally for you so you don't feel like i need to run or hide because the relationship doesn't feel trustworthy or safe right so learning to ask for learning to ask for your needs not just say okay well like, i'm just going to give up and whatever happens happens no learning or, or i'm going to leave learning to ask for your needs and at the same time not worrying about every little you know, every little thing that we can every can nitpick on about our spouse that creates this negativity and this environment of toxicity in the relationship. You know, we need to give each other a break sometimes. Mm. Yeah, and now that we're talking about it, Shlomo, you know, this was the first time I ever brought it up after I said it. So I think when we go home and we don't have you all watching, we should, or maybe we should have you all watching, we should have a dialogue to, so I can properly apologize for making that statement that I don't trust you. And we can work through what went on that really unnerved me. And we can come even closer with going through that if we feel like we need to and, and coming even closer after the after that upset. So I look Yeah, forward, I'd be happy to do that. Yeah, I look forward to doing that perhaps with you. And uh if there's anything you guys need, we're absolutely always available. This is another episode of Can This Marriage Be Saved? Um, we have many opportunities to reach us through our website, themarriagerestorationproject.com. And like I said, if you've had an affair in your marriage or a breach of trust, please reach out. It's so much better to do it with professional help than by yourself because it's just too big. Um, And you can come see us in Baltimore in November or in Costa Rica in October for a group couples therapy retreat. And then also always on demand for two days working with Rabbi Shlomo or any of our amazing Imago therapists that work on our team uh, using our methodology. So it was a pleasure. Thank you for watching. Thank you. Stay tuned for the next episode. Take care.